Okay. So, hello Francesco. Welcome everybody to the Betacast. I'm Beta. I'm Martina Dukevic. Uh, I'm uh, part of Beta EP. And this is a podcast where we uh, aim to discuss innovation and collaboration in all, ki all kinds of areas because we believe that innovation is truly everywhere. Um, so today's interview is opening a new season dedicated to Impact Hub, uh, to, to social impact, sorry, sorry. And Impact Hub is actually a very important uh, part of this uh, season because uh, we decided to do this with, uh, in a partnership with uh, Impact Hub. And today with me, um, we have uh, Francesco. Thank you so much for being here. Both Thanks so accept much for the invitation. Yeah, both uh, thank you for accepting the invitation to co-host and to co-create this season with us, with Betayi, but also to, to be here and start uh, with the first interview. For those who are not familiar yet, Francesco is the managing director and partner uh, in Impact Hub Lisbon and he has uh, a much longer story related to the social impact. So here is my first question. Can you tell us uh, how did you enter into that social impact space? Uh, was there any turning point in your life? And what for now is the most exciting thing about this? Thanks, I think it's a very interesting question because I believe everyone has this kind of haha -ha moment in his life where he kind of finds out what he would like to do. And for me, it was really um, a moment that luckily came quite early. So I would say when I was still studying in university, I, I ended up doing an engineering degree, which um, many people say I'm not really an engineer, but it just ended up that I was studying engineering. And I didn't know what I could then do after uh, my studies with a degree. And I remember in the third year of university, we had the visit from um, one of the researcher of the Frugal Innovation Center in, um, in Santa Clara University, California. And the girl was presenting us what meant actually to do uh, social innovation in developing countries. So really using engineering as a tool to drive impact and drive change in developing countries. And I remember that was probably the first class where I was so interested and so passionate about what um, this guest speaker was saying that I realized okay if in the last three years I didn't feel this for anything else it means it's something that I need to to know more I wanted to discover and that was when um, I kind of decided that I would use my spare time to dedicate uh, like some knowledge look for books look for everything that was related with the, with the social impact and since then, it kind of became part of my life. It's like a glue. And I think um, that was many years ago. And still now I really remember that was the turning point for me to decide what I wanted to do with life, what I wanted to see more as a purpose in, uh, in society. And it was something that kind of pushed me forward to do what I wanted to do and what I love doing. So, so what would you say that that's the most exciting part, not, not maybe about your work as a word, because maybe we'll touch upon this a little bit more, uh, but about the, the topic of the social impact, what like, triggers you today? Well, I think we see in general that um, the millennials generation is for sure the first generation that is not satisfied anymore with stability, with uh, private property only, with ownership of things, and actually just making money. I mean, being able to survive, it's the minimum requirement that you want for your life. But I think it came into our minds, this fact of, I want to have an impact. What's my uh, purpose in life? What should I do? And it's my contribution to the world. And this is something that actually, it's really creating frustration inside um, our generations and for me I think uh, what excites me is the fact that I can do a job which pays my salary which pays my bills which enables me to live but at the same time I'm doing something which is actually truly meaningful to society so I'm actually doing something which goes beyond beyond my ego or my personal interest which serves more people so I think this giving back and this doing good is something that really pushes you every day. And for me, the most exciting thing is for sure the fact of 
helping and uh, helping not only the smaller community of people you know and your friends, but really helping mm. society in general. And for me, this is really the key for uh, for working in this field. Yeah, and also have like the the impact on the bigger problems that not only they're like. Um, let's say defined, well defined, you know, what are the barriers, but you also know where I think you can contribute, right? Um, so um, maybe I'll skip a few questions and, and um, like uh, connect with, with what you said uh, about this generation. So um, it's often said that, that those new generations are the drivers for the social impact ecosystem growth right now. And do you think that's it? Like this is only them or how is this ecosystem looking today what are the the main uh, players let's say um and what easily could we do better to make it grow yeah well i think for sure um the younger generation is the one that uh, as i said sees uh, in his uh, in his job something that fulfills mm -hmm. both the personal interest the collective interest uh, passion, purpose, and, um, and job. But I think this young generation would for sure not be able to do it alone. Because if on one side you have the passion and the drive, on the other hand, you need the experience, you need the knowledge. And this is actually where the younger generation needs to look for help in the older generations, because I can, see perfectly and understand why I want to do something, but I might not know how and what I'm actually going to do. And this is where I think that it's very important to get everyone on board and uh, understand that if there is no planet B, everyone should be rowing in the same direction. No? And I think we have to understand that we are not on two different boats, but we are on the same bigger boat. and if someone is rowing in one direction and someone is rowing in the other direction, there will be a, a no turning back point where the boat will actually crash. So I think the fact and um, the main uh, work we have to do, and that is the weight we have on our shoulder, is not only making sure that we ourselves are doing the things we believe in, but that we get everyone else to believe in what we believe and get everyone to row in the same direction. So. I think for me, the key is making sure we are not only convincing ourselves, but convincing the others about our ideas and especially these ideas and belief that you need to have a sustainable planet, to have a sustainable business, or you won't have any business at all in the next 10 years. Yeah, and so, so it is kind of like all comes down to, to collaboration between also like generation groups and talents. Uh, right, and but but I honestly I I'm very curious what what do you think? But because this whole thing about the social impact seems to be like really growing recently, and I kind of feel that this is really like connected to to the generations that are entering right now the um, uh, the the market the, the job market, uh, and they're really kind of this influencing like starting from what you mentioned that what they expect from work, what they expect from an uh, employer, like going to, to the creating some movements, um, yeah, and like engaging different, different, uh, um, let's say parts of that ecosystem. So, so I totally... Uh, yeah. what, one of the things that I would add on and catch from, from what you said that really resonated with me was the fact of um, collaboration. And I think collaboration is key especially for, for the sector. Because if you think about traditional business, one of the first things you always analyze when you're starting your business is who are your competitors. Whenever you start a social business, the first thing you analyze is who are your potential partners. Mm. And this is really a different mind shift that pushes you from the place where you see everyone else as something that would negatively affect your business. Well, if you're doing something that starts from your heart and you believe that must be doing something good for, for humanity, you immediately think everyone else is not a competitor because they're doing something good. So this is actually, it kind of creates this mind shift where you look 
for other people, other projects, other organizations to partner up with. And what seems to be already hard, which is, okay, how do I grow my business? Then becomes also something that it's a collective need because if you want just to grow a business and then this has negative impact on the planets, if you want to grow a social business, everyone wants to join that because your purpose is the fact of doing good. So everyone naturally feels that they can be part of it. And I think for me, the shift from competition uh, to collaboration is what characterizes a bit the sector. And I think this is also why now there are more projects uh, that are starting. And as you said, it seems kind of recent. I'm not sure if, if, if it really is because terms were, um, were created really like, I would say the first person who talked about social business was Yunus with microcredit and we were back in the 80s. So I would say it's recent compared to, I don't know, the traditional big corporations that you can date back to the, the last century. But anyhow, I think it's uh, something that it's evolving and it's, it's, it's exploding because uh, if before you knew you could just focus on your business without any plain, uh, planet boundaries, now you know you have the planet boundaries. We're bombarded with, with information about uh, the Earth shooting day. We don't have any more resources. So now the fact is, if we really don't want to implode, we need to find the solutions and we need to do it faster. So I think that is also why it's ex really accelerating now this transition. And uh, so, so also thank you because you mentioned like that uh, there were businesses that were just focusing and growing, not really doing good. But like, how do you think, how come uh, we had the situation that a, like creating a business didn't have that part of the social impact? But although maybe in some part always it has a social impact because it's about the employment and so on. But like very often, uh, especially in the past centuries or, or even earlier, um, there are so many cases or of organization that eventually didn't really care about the, the social impact. It kind of happened right now. Do you like recall what was the moment when, when it all started to change that we again put innovation and you know social impact together in a business that doing well, business should always mean doing good as well. Yeah, I think here we have to differentiate a lot when we talk about um, maybe a social enterprise or a socially responsible enterprise. Because I think here it's also different when you compare a small startup or project that has as its final aim the fact that they want to do that the best they can. And then the other thing is, a big organization which is now in a transition. A big organization that knows that they're doing, I would say, traditional business, but they want to make sure that they're doing it in the right way, that they're positively impacting communities, and that they can also actually reduce as much as they can the negative impact on the environment. And for me, being part of this transition also means making sure we are all together in this transition because you need the startup and the smaller social enterprise, but you need also the big giants to move with you. Because uh, most of the time, this was also something that personally I had to, to get used to that. Because if you think, whenever you, and you're mentioning, whenever you work with social impact, innovation, with big corporation, you're starting from a point where they were created before maybe these concepts were on, on the table and now they are they're realizing that they need to be leading this uh, this next steps because either they will not be in business anymore or they see consumers pressure is increasing uh, on, on on the fact that they need to be actually considering the triple bottom line so i think um, for me you need to have a bit of everything because when you do even a smaller change in a very big giant, the impact can be much bigger than doing a systemic change in a small project. So I think for me, it's really the matter of as long as everyone is moved from their heart, from their passion and from the drive that they want to do something and they really mean it, I think this is, it's already the fact of their, their soul 
is aiming at creating impact. Yeah. Then the way it's manifest, I think uh, you have tons of different species and that's that's really what's also nice because then they that's the way how they complement each other and here i think it's also the role of organization as ours where you take smaller projects and startups you take bigger corporations and you make sure the small startups scale inside the corporation and the corporation learn with the smaller uh, startups and i think this for me it's the basic of the evolution and survival of uh, of corporations in the next 10 years yeah i mean uh, absolutely i i agree we also uh, see the same in, in betai that um especially over the, the last years there there's been a great shift in those big organizations that are really ready to to work with uh, with startups that it's no longer like this you know um uh, like this being that that she don't know what to do with but if they really start to 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 look at this or they are looking on this as a real uh, business partners um so i'm i'm super happy to to hear that that uh, you also see this happening um in the social impact uh, area um so i would like to ask you if if we got to this business and, and social impact uh, um uh, area um so could you tell us like what are the the main initiatives that that you are doing in impact hub because you all already mentioned about connecting uh, um startups with corporates but i know you do much much more so can you tell what you do here in lisbon what is so specific here but also worldwide because you're a huge organization mm -hmm. yeah i think um what is really at the core of our business is the community and actually um i would say the vision we have is always community first and with community we mean everyone that is kind of navigating around the, the organization so it's the corporate partners the startups the civic society and the way we see it is that the community always needs a space to express themselves to get together to do projects this is why one of the core elements of, of our organization is the fact that we have a physical space where people can come and work organize events to inspire people and this is basically, I would say, the engine that moves everything. And then around this, uh, this engine and this wheel, you have all the other projects that enable you to have the impact. So the programs we do uh, always try to, um, to engage with the mission that the corporation have on the positive impact they want to have on society and the fact that they always need someone to actually do the things with them. So, our role is really be the doers, the makers, the one that um, transform their vision into something actionable and real. So just to give you an example, what um, one of the projects we've been doing this year um, and then the last year uh, was, a, was a project that we designed together with Coca-Cola and Coca-Cola had as one of their, uh, their strategic objectives to empower 5 million women by 2020. And that goal was five by 20 around the world. And what we've been doing with them was uh, designing um, boot camps for uh, groups of 100 women here in Lisbon, in Porto, and all over Spain to actually give to this um, female entrepreneurship community not only the network and the connections they needed um, to start their business, but as well the content and the know how they needed to be in business. And this was one of the programs we designed with the with, uh, with a private partner as well. Um, what we do is uh, engage with, uh, with foundations. So we've been running uh, for two years a program called the Escola de Impacto, which will be launching now as well. Um, then of uh, another edition where we um, will support entrepreneurs uh, that have been affected by, by COVID and by economic recession to actually restart and uh, reboot their uh, their business and we will be supporting them again with the, with the training with the mentoring and with entrepreneurs uh, entrepreneurial skills that they need to start the project or as well other initiatives are related more with public funding so we um, will be also doing uh, a big program together with the european union together uh, with other european partners which is a, a circular fashion accelerator which will cover uh, five countries and we will be supporting 30 startups that work in the field of circular fashion 
and we will be training them both here in Lisbon, some project will be in, um, in Sweden, some will be in Berlin, and others will be in Athens. And what we do is actually make sure that you have these cool ideas that are maybe developed in the small village or in another town, and how do you replicate them in other countries? So it's really about scaling successful examples of social innovation all over uh, Europe. And this is part of, um, of this other initiative called the, the Circular Fashion Accelerator. That's amazing. I, I honestly haven't heard about this, but, but I can't wait to, to see this happening uh, because this is also extremely uh, interesting area also with the great potential, right, to, to do the social uh, impact, uh, let's say initiatives and startups. Mm -hmm. So that's amazing. And uh, uh, I know that the, well, everybody knows uh, that social, uh, the Impact Hub is, is a worldwide organization. So I think uh, what I see that is um, extremely important for you is to, what you say, the community, but the whole, let's say, world network that wherever you go, you actually can have, find your hub and your people to do this. Uh, this is really amazing thing. I, I, I admire this a lot. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And I think it's a lot. I mean, I feel it whenever I, I go and travel to a city. One of the first things I do is to, to go and visit the impact of it that exists. And for me, it's a lot about meeting people that you, you know have the same mindset. It's like being in a family. So I think you start immediately from a point where the other uh, people or members of the community already thinks in the same way you think and it creates immediately empathy and a connection that you can then look around and think okay what could we do together i really like your idea you really like mine how can we actually make sure we, we collaborate and this works on on the personal level whenever you go and uh, it's more a human connection but as well i think for um for startups and for entrepreneurs um we now have to think on, on the local level. So you have to think locally, what's your impact, but as well, always keep an eye, how can you globally expand your impact? And I think sometimes there's no need to reinvent the wheel and it's a lot about replicating initiatives that work in more locations, in more countries. And this is really what uh, being part of a network means. It's the fact that you, not only identify with the values, the mission and, and the manifesto that the network has, but as well that you take advantage of, of, of the learning that other countries had and of the scaling opportunity it gives you. So I think for me, the fact of uh, having international presence, it's also, uh, it gives you a voice uh, for you to be heard, and for you to actually uh, make sure you can you can spread the word and you have actually uh, an awareness and the uh, mm -hmm. and the weight in the discussions yeah so so whoever's listening just in the area go and find your impact hub because i'm sure there is one in the city you live in um okay so you mentioned about the, all those initiatives and programs that you're doing projects can you tell us a little bit more more how you measure the impact like or how it's done basically how can we measure social impact in projects in organizations uh what is the best um let's say um uh, where should we look at this or how to implement in the project well, I think um, measuring social impact is not really different from measuring any other performance indicator. It's just uh, the fact that instead of choosing only financial or um, other type of indicator, you really see about, okay, what is my contribution to uh, communities and to the environment? And I think for us, it's it's really the um, one of the starting point, like, you know, if the uh, the, the motto, if, if you cannot measure it, you cannot really uh, improve it. This applies also to impact. If you cannot, if you don't know where you are, you also don't know where you're going next. And I think whenever we design a program or we think, okay, what, what is our goal? You have to set indicators that can support you. And 
this is actually there's no magic formula that applies okay what's what's the impact you want to have it really depends and this is also a bit harder it really applies to the specific situation so for example for us one of the key metrics we have is impact up because every year we run uh, a global impact survey we, our um, vision is really to to connect inspire and enable entrepreneurs to do good so how do we measure how we inspire people mm -hmm. and this is actually just to break it down into some indicators is is measured through how many events you do how many people after joining the event they got some something that moved them and decided to to start a project how many uh, people uh, if you want to connect them how many people that are working from our space felt they increased their network and their and their circle of uh, friends and colleagues how many uh, people received uh, introduction uh, to other business partners and if you want to see how you enable actually these entrepreneurs you have to see if i came here with a revenue of 10k and i left after one year with a revenue of 100k what happened in the middle apart from time that supported me to actually reach this objective so i think here is a lot about okay did you receive any um, any training from the impact app did you uh, take part in any acceleration program uh, if yes did you got any seed funding so i think according to the to the project you're designing you have to define the right set of metrics yeah. and i think it's, it's 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 the basic you should always have it as, as the starting point and do you see this happening uh, in in startups that that come to work with you or especially in in uh, uh, bigger organization in corporates that this is not only csr but they they are really able uh to measure the social impact that they have is it happening or you don't really see i think that? we're no no i see it happening i just believe we're still in a in an early stage compared to the maturity level you can see in other in other sectors and other businesses and i think um what you really have to like for startups what's the biggest obstacle for them to measure impact i would say time and resources and knowledge because they don't have maybe the internal skills and capacity to have someone who's expert on impact measurement yeah and this is maybe the biggest barrier for a startup well, if you take a corporation the barriers are completely different they have time they have the resources to pay someone to do that now the objective is why do they do that do they do it only because they want to have a better communication or they want to appear as the good ones or do they do it because this is actually part of their mission of the company and it's not a nice to have card to show but it's actually their business as usual and this is what I think now businesses are trying to shift, moving from a CSR um, mindset where you were doing philanthropy and you were just uh, giving some money to, to organizations to making sure um, the, the social responsibility is core and is inside your, uh, your main business. Because there it's where it sticks there it's where it lasts and there it's where you have a long-term impact and not only short-term output mm -hmm. yeah yeah so staying with the obstacles uh, that you already mentioned inside of the big and small organizations what other uh, obstacles do you see for uh, the social impact entrepreneurship nowadays maybe to make it easier we could focus for example on portugal and while discussing this, can you also think of some um, weak wins that uh, we could achieve to actually boost the growth uh, and the strength of the whole ecosystem? For me, I think if I would mention the, the biggest, I think we should try to, to get its pipeline. We need a huge pipeline of projects and you need the, a cultural shift. Like you see, countries where social entrepreneurship is like the front line as you can see for example the uk there 
social entrepreneurs first are legally recognized and this is the main obstacle now here in portugal because whenever you want to start a business should i register as a company or as an ngo because in the in the middle it's a gray zone social entrepreneurs don't exist for the portuguese government so this is for sure one of the quick fix to, to make sure they have a legal status and a legal entity to represent them and then secondly i think it's uh, how do you make sure that you have this pipeline of projects it, this means that you have to start from a culture where in universities and even before maybe people are see entrepreneurship as a way to to learn and as a way where it's not about failure but it's about a learning like yeah, one of the nicest sentences i never fail i either win or learn and this is something that it's about culture and the way you see it and i think university has to give the opportunity to people to not only project themselves in uh, okay i want to work for a big corporation and do my task but also i want to start my own business and I want to start maybe a social business. And it's starting from there where you have young people that want to start their business and you match them with more experienced people. You make sure you have these ideas and then the ideas need a space to make these ideas become businesses. Then once you move to the next stage is, okay, they need an MVP, okay, they need a startup, they need to scale anything. What we see here in Portugal for me as the main obstacle is that you don't have this very smooth pipeline where everyone actually uh, covers this pipeline and works together to make it grow you have some punctual player that are there along the along the line but i think there is a need to make it bigger to make it faster and to actually increase uh, the diameter of the cone of the pipeline you need to have much more because otherwise you end up with people that want to invest in social impact startups, but they don't have any startups to invest mm -hmm. in. Yeah. So they need to go abroad to, for the projects. Or as well, you can have the, uh, the opposite thing. You have lots of students that think social entrepreneurship is very cool, but then they don't keep on with the projects because after one month they try, they don't make it and they just give up. So I would say for me, making sure you have um, governmental support and um, and really public authorities acknowledging that social entrepreneurship can be the future and then as well making sure you have enough projects because also for social entrepreneurs the ra ratio is the same out of 90 out of 100 uh, percent of projects 90 will fail anyhow we're still talking about entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and for me you need, therefore, to have 100 projects to get the last 10 that are really making a meaningful impact at the end. And uh, so uh, I, I think I, I would uh, relate to both uh, opinions that you shared here. Shared here. Um, do you think Impact Cup will get more involved in, in being on this culture side to, to really fill the gaps for people to have a smooth transition from the moment, oh, I have the idea, to the moment where they are really a scale up uh, um, in the social impact area, do you think uh, it is something you're trying to do? Yeah, that's for sure our our territory. Like actually, one of the nicest image I remember is uh, um, uh, our uh, global uh, director that was showing a picture of uh, when you think about uh, IT startups like Google. Uh, Microsoft, Apple, they all started like in, in the garage of, of some mm. engineers. No? And what, what you think our goal is when you think about social entrepreneurs, you all want them to start here at the hub. So if uh, the sentence that was going along was, everyone has the ideas to make the world a better place, but then they need a place to make it happen. And this is actually our role. And this is where we see ourselves um, in being these connectors, these facilitators, and um, yes, we think physically connections are actually stronger. Yeah. Now we have to shift to digital. We don't know how it would be in the future, mm -hmm. but I, I for sure think that I would consider that uh, my work is a success if I see lots of people meeting and lots of people actually starting their business, and then I hope get that 
are growing. But yeah, that's that's for sure our our land. Yeah, and about the uh, government support and this legal, uh, let's say, uh, uh, I don't know if you call it favors or, but the legal framework for sure for social entrepreneurs. Do you, do do impact hub is uh, doesn't impact hub is anyhow involved in uh, open conversation with the government to change stuff would you see for example also maybe a benchmark from from other countries have you seen this happening that uh, it is a successful it can be a successful conversation between entrepreneurs and the different organization like yours and government or policymakers yeah i, I think for sure it's um is as well something I believe Portugal should work on, and um, we want to be in, the, in that table. Um, we, we want to be with uh, with policymakers to really uh, give inputs about how we think it should look like, and um, and then the I would say the main obstacles we see now for public authorities to do that is maybe they don't see what's what's in it for them. They need to have the, the business case. They need to see other uh, more um, courageous countries to actually take the initiative, take the risk, maybe fail and then succeed for them to, to replicate it. And I think it's, it's always like that. You see, um, you see some, someone else uh, doing it and then you have this fear of missing out that you also have to do it. Come on, you don't want yeah, to be and yeah, it's like we have the safe field to, yeah. to actually do things. So, uh, do you know, like, or can you say um, the regions or countries that actually could be an inspiration for Portugal? Uh, to look at you yeah, mentioned, think, UK, but is it like the absolute leader in you in European or Europe? Let's say, <laughs> not correct. I European. think, yeah. For example, in in the UK, you have uh, social entrepreneurship UK, which is for sure. It's definitely a, a leading organization, but just not to put down Portugal, we also have the, the Social Innovation Fund, which is really, um, it's a case study for Europe as well. We have like the participatory budget, which is also not social entrepreneurship, but it's the way you engage citizens. So I think that's also a point for Portugal. What I think we can also then look around and be inspired is for sure the work some cities are doing with uh, um, with impact. So I, I can mention Amsterdam, which um, the impact Hub has been working for many years with the municipality of Amsterdam to build uh, the impact entrepreneurship ecosystem. So to really make sure they have what we see here in Lisbon with the uh, Made of Lisboa and the entrepreneur ecosystem, but focus on impact. So that was a, a very interesting case study. And then this leads the municipality to also consider it at the broader level. And now the municipality of Amsterdam, it's probably the first one in the world, which is using the, the donut economic model to, um, to guide their decisions uh, for everything, for the environment, for society, and for, uh, for economic purposes as well. Yeah, that's, um, I, I really hope to, to see this happening here because I really feel uh, I also, um, I'm an expert here in this, but probably as you, you're for a more, uh, much longer time. But I remember the feeling that I uh, had when I came here for the first time to, to get to know the ecosystem a little bit better was that the, really the social impact, like it's a super trendy thing. Like everybody's talking about this. So, so I thought there must be really a lot happening and I see there is, there are many organizations we have also like acceleration uh, accelerators um, just focus on that, like the activities that you do. There are some NGOs as well devoted to this. So I really hope that uh, this is a good basis for uh, for the future. And in the coming years, we hopefully, uh, Little Lisbon, that will be um, definitely a leader in this. And um, so I have to yeah, um, they're going uh, towards the end of our conversation here, but I have still a few topics to, to, to talk about. Um, I would like to ask you that, would you agree that 
crises uh, are the trigger for the social impact movements. Looking at the, the most recent and still present example of the worldwide pandemic, how would you comment um, on what was happening with all those initiatives like Tech for COVID that was in Portugal, in France, for example, there was an initiative called Stop COVID-19. Uh, what is the real impact on of um, movements like this on solving societal problems? Yeah, I think for me, whenever you have this type of crisis, which are not only financials, but a really, um, this was a health crisis, but you have environmental crisis, you're basically being uh, put in a place where you're facing what could be the consequences of your act in the next 10 years, no? So you're kind of, it's almost like, you know, when when you do something and you, you think, ah, oh, I could have died, but I made it. Now I have another awareness and I want to do things differently, no? So I think for me, this is the same thing that happened now. People were like, oh, pandemics could really kill us. What can we do to make sure this doesn't happen in the future? And it all starts with taking care of the planet first. And um, I think this was something then the necessity is always the mother of everything that, that you do. And you saw it with the with different movement you mentioned, for example, now we've seen tech for COVID, which was a movement where you bring together uh, all the creators, engineers, uh, consultants like civic society in general to kind of trying to that they want to do something they feel they need to contribute and this is a is a, is a channel for them to to engage and you saw it here in this case but for example one of the other examples that i, I remember very well it's about urban agriculture every time there's a crisis cities become uh, like land for uh, food production like when in detroit we had the 2008 crisis and general motors shut down most of its uh, industries there people didn't have anything to eat so they went back to okay how do we make sure we we produce here uh, our food and the way they saw it was let's do it in the most sustainable way so thinking about varieties thinking about organic agriculture thinking about the way they would like really to see it and uh, the way they would like to consume. And then you saw it in, in, in other occasions and as well, I believe now people had the opportunity to, to rethink what is a priority and to rethink what they would like to see in the next 10 years happening. And that's when they can put pressures on governments, on companies, on their neighborhoods, on everyone else to actually do the same and rethink together what, what the future uh, should look like. Yeah, and uh, I probably will agree that it was really beautiful uh, to see that uh, like the power was given to people that uh, we didn't need to, like uh, any, I mean, frameworks made by government and so on. Yeah, definitely we need support, but uh, the people just organize themselves. Like um, that few organizations created a platform where to put challenges, to work on them together. And actually this is amazing. It's also, uh, I think um, that was a trigger to, to start this. It was like the, like one day accelerator like lockdown okay let's let's see who who is really uh, hurt in this situation the most and focus on on solving those things and the other thing uh, as i also show and would like to share here that it was uh, absolutely great to to see that so many organizations and uh, platforms with different tools were just opening for entrepreneurs like if you really want to do something and this is like it's kind of indirect uh, collaboration, right? Be, like it's just a network that is like, everybody's opening. There's no me competitors, uh, but as you mentioned uh, that everybody find, found a way to become this uh, social positive, like how you call this, that there is a very nice phrase, like positive, social positive impact or something like this. I mean, <laughs> organization with the positive social impact. 
so uh, that was uh, really, I mean, um, amazing. I, I kind of felt I couldn't catch up with this because there were so many things happening. But there were special newsletters for that. So um, I think this is this is a beautiful thing about the humankind that when we need, we really can do things. We can bring that change. Um, Okay, so one before the last uh, question that I have for you. So in your work, you're uh, particularly close to uh, entrepreneurs, to startups, and you for sure assisted many, many success stories. Can you tell us this magic formula for a social enterprise? What is the cr most crucial factor that makes a social enterprise successful? Actually, um... I read the, the question you sent me and I didn't have an answer, but now that you repeated it, the first thing that came to my mind was resilience. And I think it's the fact of, um, you can have like uh, uh, an oak tree, which is robust, no? and you can compare it as a, as a big corporation, which is, it's wood, it's big, it's solid. And then you have, uh, other type of wood, for example, bamboo, which is, uh, which is resilient and it's, uh, it's flexible, can adapt, uh, can actually become curved and go back straight and curve in the other direction. And I think for me, a social entrepreneur is like bamboo. He's someone who is able to adapt, who is actually much more um, willing to see how everything around him changes and also himself change and uh, rethink according to the situation. And for me, knowing that you will have uh, bad times, you will have good and good times, you will have to pass through, uh, through failures and these failures will make you then stronger if you survive. For me, this is actually the, the resilience quality is definitely the one I think uh, mm -hmm. social entrepreneurs should have and should work more on. Yeah, and uh, from from what I hear, I of course uh, I see that uh, this is this is extremely important. But it seems that this social entrepreneurship has to really come by heart and by the way the um, the the type of person you are. That you're really open to to what is happening around, being able to to see those little details and have different mindset that we mentioned that there are no competitors. This is your collaborators, your network, and uh, right. Um, okay, so absolutely the last super quick question uh, to finish our um, our conversation here. Uh, let's uh, wrap up with it's a personal one. Uh, what does innovation mean to you? For me, actually, and this is probably also because I'm in the, the social innovation sector. It all starts with the with the need you want to solve, and for me, innovating it's about you had a problem and you gave the solution. So that's for me the, the key of innovation, making sure you transform something that you didn't know how to solve, you saw it as something that was creating you pain and then you made sure you had uh, the right solution to solve your problem. So for me, that would be the, the main uh, definition of innovation. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, great to hear this. So Francesco, Thank you very much uh, for your time, for being here and, and sharing your thoughts uh, about uh, the social impact. It was absolutely great to, to hear you. And for everybody who is still there uh, watching this uh, interview, I, rec I really encourage you to subscribe to our channel because every Thursday we will be posting uh, uh, and publishing for you a new episode so you can follow up uh, with the new guests. Uh, and thank you for um, everything. Thank you, friends. Thank you, Martina, for the invitation. Thank you.